you in the life of our church. We study the Bible, and as we study the Bible, we have uh, an outline. And the outline is designed to help you be able to really keep up. And notice that there on the left margin of your outline, what do you see on the piece of paper? You see some holes that are there. What does that indicate? That means you could put it in a notebook. That means you could hold on to this. That means that you could go back to it. In the way that we study the Bible, there is a resource here um, for you to, as you go through the rest of your life, to be able to look back and see the preached Word of God to our lives. And uh, I want to encourage you with that um, to uh, take good notes, uh, make other references here, and hold on to these, be able to go back over them this week as we study the Word of God. I want us to back up and look at just the plain picture that is on the screen. Back up one more slide there. How many of you enjoy the mountains? Do you enjoy the mountains? I love the mountains. I grew up in South Florida, and here it's just flat as a board. You know, it's just the way it is. And if it wasn't for the sea, I would have a hard time. I love the ocean, and uh, I love the sea. I love to be on it. I love to be in it. I love to be under it. Um, But every year as a kid growing up, we would go to North Carolina. And uh, there was something that was very refreshing about the mountains. There was something very encouraging to my spirit. And um, as I have thought about this last year, um, you know, about a year ago, we were in the midst of running around looking for toilet paper and everything else. Um, These have been difficult days. These have been strange times. And I am so excited and thankful that God's Word knows what we need. And God's Word in the book of of 1 John is an encouragement. And just as I see a sunrise in the mountains and feel encouraged, and just as I see the glory of God's goodness in a bright new day, as I think about Lamentations number 3, that His mercies are new every morning. I don't know how many times I've been in the mountains and watched the sunrise in the mountains and just thought, man, His mercies are new to me every day. And that's, that's what I need because I am such a sinner. Um, But God's grace is so good to us. Well, I have prayed that 1 John would be like a mountain visit to you. I have prayed that 1 John would encourage you. I have prayed that 1 John would assure you or convict you and help you get right. There's been times when I've gone off to retreat in the mountains, whether it be in North Carolina or where my in-laws live in the Rockies, and I'm there, and God often straightens me out. Um, sometimes, I don't know, some of the other guys at the staff might say, well, you need to go to the mountains and get straightened out, Pastor. Um, but I, I go up there, and he, he corrects me, and he reforms me and renews me. And um, I want to encourage you that this little letter at the end of your New Testament can correct you, it can warn you, and it can renew you. So this morning, the title of the message is 1 John, Loving, Firm Encouragement. And I believe that you're going to find that, Loving, Firm Encouragement this morning. Well, it's very interesting. As we begin our study of 1 John, let me just kind of clarify for you that there is a difference in a purely um, a, a personal Bible study or maybe even a corporate Bible study and a Bible study that is meant to be a time of preaching. Um, there are some things that we will cover as we preach through this that a Bible study would not cover. Um, And there are some times that we will not cover things that an in-depth Bible study would cover that part of the issue of pulpit preaching is that we are listening together for the whole body of a passage of Scripture as God leads us to hear the Word of God preached. Um, If I was going to say everything that could be said about 1 John, we would preach on it for 50 years. There's far more in 1 John that could ever be truly um, explored and profoundly exclaimed. But that's not what we'll do. We'll go through this as we go through our other passages of Scripture. We have just finished Micah a couple of months ago, and now we run to this beautiful little letter of 1 John. Three key verses, and I want you to make some notes here. Look in the box on the page that is here. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 
4 says, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Very interesting. He says we are writing these things. So he's, he's saying, why is it that we write these things? Because our joy. And we see the inclusive that he's saying we as believers, we as those who are leading. Um, the apostle John is writing. We are writing this and notice the reason. So that our joy, all of us, all of us, our joy can be complete. God wants us to be Encourage. That's right at the beginning. And then one chapter in. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. Let's read it out loud together. Let's read 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 out loud. Are you ready? Here we go. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So notice that in verse chapter 1 verse 4 he says that he's writing these things for our joy and then in chapter 2 verse 1 he's saying I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin right out there to the side holiness that holiness is important then look at number the third passage of scripture here first John chapter 5 and verse 13 I love this one I've sat down and shared this verse with many many people over the years as we've talked about the gospel Look at what he says in 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Read it out loud together. That you may know that you have eternal life. You see, he's writing these things so that we can be encouraged. And he's writing these things so that we can be right. So that we can be right with God. So that we can be holy. In fact, fill these out. The three repeating themes of this is, number one, happiness. We see this come up over and over again in 1 John, that he desires that we would discover the happiness of knowing Jesus. But number two, not only the happiness, but also the holiness. And we're going to see that those two things are actually connected. That as we grow in holiness, and that's what he says, so that you may not sin, so that you're not lost in false doctrine, so that you're not lost in disobedience, in holiness. But also, number three, I love it, security. God doesn't want his people to be wondering if they're saved. He doesn't want his people running around in fear, doubting. God wants you to know, dear brother, God wants you to know, dear sister, that you are his and that you are his forever. That is his design. Our God is a good God. You see, an evil father may want his children to sometimes wonder if he, is, if he loves them. An evil mother may sometimes withhold love and make a child wonder if, if the child is loved by God. God is never like that. God, the perfect parent, understands that love covers a multitude of sins, and that love is what the human heart has been designed for. And so he has a heart of love that we would be secure in him. So, um, those, are, so those are some key themes over the next few months as we study this that we're going to see. I want us to also see a repeating three-part cascade. And this is kind of like a waterfall that goes from one set of rocks down to another pool and then down to another pool. And this happens over and over again in these little five chapters that are here. The first one is the idea of right belief. John is writing to the early churches and he is saying to them, you must have sound doctrine. You must believe the right things. But not only have right belief, but you also must have right behavior. It's not just that you believe things and are spiritually made right, but then do whatever you want in the flesh, do whatever you want in this world. No, that's not the way that it works with God. He wants us to believe the right things, and he wants us to behave in the right way. And then as we experience right belief and right behavior, we discover real love. That's when we be de begin to discover real love between us and God and God and us and us and others and others with us. This is what it all results to. And so as we read 1 John 
all the way through in a few moments. We're going to read the whole little book in just a few moments. As we read through this, you're going to see this. You're going to see the importance of right belief. You're going to see the expression and the, the um, tremendous statements about who Christ is and who God is and what he has done. You're going to see admonitions toward right behavior. You're going to see that. And then you're going to see the call to real love, the call to true love. Now, let me just say that the world actually is desperate for these things. They don't know it, but all of their lashing out, all of their striving, all of their trying, all of the extreme measures that you see all around the world with everybody doing their thing, whatever that is, whether it's their little rice burner car that's super loud running down Sheridan Street at 100 miles an hour, and you know that's their thrill, or whether it's their great big house, or whether it's their photography, or whether it's their sports, or whatever, whatever it may be. Maybe it's their vices. Maybe it's the, the things that are, that are the demons that keep calling them back to the things that are destroying their lives. The world is dying for right belief, right behavior, and real love. And why? Because that's what God created us for. And so when we don't have his right belief, his right behavior, and his real love in our life, we are chasing after something that will fill the void. Well, um, let's just recognize there's different types of literature in the Bible, and the genre of this little letter is that it's called a general epistle. It's called a general epistle. What's an epistle except a letter? You can fill both of those in. It's really an open letter. Now, why do we call it a general epistle? Well, that's opposed to a specific one. A specific one is, is addressed to a certain church, to a certain city. When you look at the book of Ephesians, it's written to the church at Ephesus. When you look at the book of Philippians, it's written to the church at Philippi. When you look at Romans, it's written to the churches at Rome. But there are some of the letters that are written to everyone. Um, and so we see James is one of those letters. We studied that a few years ago. It's to the believers who are scattered abroad, um, scattered outside of Israel. We, we see other letters that are general. Well, 1 John is one of those. It is a general letter. And notice underneath that it says there's no specific recipient, so no one is named, not an individual or a city. There's no introduction, so it, it really, there, there, there's not a, a particular thing that gives the setting very much. There's no greeting. There's no greeting about it. And there's no conclusion. So it kind of doesn't even look like a letter, but there's something that makes it a letter. And it's the next thing here. Notice here. It is most definitely a warm and loving tone. It's a warm and loving tone. It's a letter. No doubt about it. It was a letter that was meant to be distributed widely, and it was a letter that was meant to encourage and correct the church. Notice it's not a treatise. If there's something that's a treatise, that's a strong statement, uh, that's, a, that's simply making some points, that's not it. Here we see the heart of a pastor. And so as we read, as we study over these next few months, as we dive into this little letter at the end of your New Testament, we're going to see the heart of a pastor. And what pastor are we going to see? Well, his name is John. His name is John, and he was one of the disciples. He was one of the disciples who was called an apostle. And you say, okay, well, what's the difference? A disciple is generally, you can use the term, a follower, a follower. We used to call disciples when I was Campus Crusade for Christ. He was a BLT. Um, you say, a BLT, a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich? Is that what you mean? A BLT? Well, we said, no, a believer, a learner, and a teacher. That's what a disciple is. He, he believes the truth. He learns the truth. But then he doesn't just believe it and learn it. He becomes himself. He becomes a what? A, a teacher of the truth. That's what a true disciple is because that's what Jesus had led us to do. But he is a, he's a disciple. What is an apostle? We see here that an apostle is one who is sent out on a mission. 
Um, one who is sent out with a task to do. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 13. It says, and when, the day came, and when day came, Jesus called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named what? Apostles. So you see both of those words there. And then, so circle the word disciples, circle the word apostles, and then look at verse 14. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, so there's two brothers, Peter and Andrew. And then James and John, it's interesting that we always hear James and John mentioned, and Philip and Bartholomew, and then the list goes on. But here we see that Jesus called them apostles. So this John, who's writing this letter, was commissioned by Jesus. Um, We're going to get more out of this letter if we know John a little bit better. Let's remember a few things here. The first point is this, is that John is one of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, as we just mentioned. They were also known as the sons of thunder. Now, we don't really know why they were called the sons of thunder. Were they big and, you know, did they have a deep voice? Maybe they were known as the deep voice. Or were they kind of rambunctious, you know? Were they often bumping into each other and fighting a little bit? Um, we know that the disciples were colorful characters. There's no doubt about it. We, we don't, we're, not, we're not sure exactly why they were called the sons of thunder. That, that leaves a little bit to the imagination. But we see that Jesus, notice this, excuse me, that John was in Jesus' inner circle. He was in Jesus' inner circle. And let's just say these three names together that are right there after that. Are you ready? Peter, James, and John. Can we say that again? Peter, James, and John. One more time. Peter, James, and John. As you read the Gospels, you will see that Jesus was was always around Peter, James, and John, or they were always around Jesus. This was the inner crowd. Some of the disciples might go off and do other tasks and do other things, but Peter, and James, and John were always listed as being right there. Um, In fact, notice this, it was John who was closest to Christ at the last Passover supper. There at the last supper, it was John who was said to be leaning against Christ's breast, leaning against his chest, just right there next to him on the table. You know, they, they didn't have chairs. They would have been laying around on the floor around the table. That's how you typically eat in the Middle East on pillows or on blankets. And um, it's a very laid-back setting. And so everybody has to kind of be leaning on somebody if it's not a very huge room. And so John, as always, was just next to Jesus. Notice this as well. John was the youngest of the disciples and the apostles. So he was, he was the youngest. He, he was the most youthful at the beginning. But it's interesting, as, he, as time would go on, he became the oldest of them. You say, what do you mean? Well, they begin to die off. As time goes on, we see that John very apparently lived a long time. And so as as the church expanded, as they went and preached the gospel around the world, the Mediterranean world, persecution rose up. And as persecution rose up, The apostles were martyred. They were put to death. And eventually, John was the only one that was not put to death. Notice here with me in in that way when we come to reading these. Look at this. John writes five New Testament books. So he was very young, but he goes on to write the Gospel of John, which is called the fourth Gospel. And he writes 1 John, which we're studying now. And then a little tiny letter after that, 2 John, and then an even smaller letter after that called 3 John, and then what about the biggie? Revelation. Revelation. So we see that, that John was, was very, very close to Christ and young early on, but as the decades would go on, he grows to be a tremendously influential figure in the early church. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the Gospel of John, and we studied it for almost three years, um, several years ago, six years ago, we finished it, but we studied the Gospel of John, I think 113 sermons um, from the Gospel of John. We, we, we looked at this, and we said that, 
John's gospel was all about being evangelistic. That's what John's gospel was. You can just put that in the parentheses under there. John was writing so people would believe. He's presenting the signs. He's presenting the teachings of Jesus. And over and over and over again, we hear John saying, I'm writing this so that you may believe. I'm writing this so that you may receive the gospel. But then when we come to 1 John, we see that it's not evangelistic, it's encouraging. That's what this is about. It's encouraging God's people to hold on to the truth and to let go of the world. Very, very strong, firm, loving encouragement. Now one of the things that I love about John's writing is this, and it's the third to the last there on the bottom Notice what it says, John writes very artistically, circle the word artistically. He does that. He writes artistically, weaving words and themes and structures with beauty and precision. Now, if you, if you were going to say, uh, you know, if one of the Gospels reads like a, an, a manual for your washing machine, it would probably be the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is just direct. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. He said this, and this happened. Well, the Gospel of John is not like that at all. It's on the opposite end of the spectrum. In the begin- he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word it was with God. The Word was God. He, was in- he, he goes artistically flowing through the story of the Gospel, the story of Christ's life, and he is using imagery of light and darkness, righteousness and evil. He's using imagery all the way through his gospel, the gospel of John. He's using imagery woven beautifully and structured in a very particular way. Now, we also see in 1 John, he does something similar. He's using certain words and he's using certain expressions. And then one of the biggest things we're going to see is the structure of it is a repeating structure so that he graciously as a pastor knows that people need to hear things and they need to hear it a couple of different ways, multiple times in order for them to get it. And we'll see that that's how he has structured this. So notice this as well. John lives, he leads, he pastors. For 30 years more, 30 30 more years after Paul is beheaded in 65 AD. So Paul is beheaded right around 65 AD under persecution. And so John is still leading for many years. You know, we often trace the book of Acts. We see the ministries of Peter and Paul. We we see much of the unfolding of the new church exploding across the Mediterranean world, and it's a very beautiful thing to see. But here we see that Peter goes all the way into a realm that people usually don't hear very much about. And it's coming up on the great persecution that is going to hit the church. And he is a key leader as those difficulties come. Notice the next thing. The last one there on the page is, John's latter years are lived in Ephesus. Now that's a city in Turkey. And on Patmos, that's an island off of Turkey. And I want you to kind of notice the screen in front of you. It'd be hard to do a biblical backgrounds message, um, getting the right picture, if we didn't have this. Just kind of notice North Africa's there at the bottom. To the right um, of your screen, you're going to see uh, the Middle East. I didn't mark it, but you see the Nile Delta there, that green thing that's going up toward um, the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And there is Jerusalem on that far right side. But then there's Turkey up on the north end of the Mediterranean. And there in Turkey, about to the left end of Turkey, against that sea, is the city of Ephesus. And it was a glorious city with a glorious past. In fact, notice this next one. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was in Ephesus. This is an artist's rendering of the temple um, of Artemis that was there. The temple of Artemis was massive. It was 180 feet wide and almost 400 feet long. 
It was a glorious display of marble and gold and ivory, all kinds of imagery that was there. Um, that was built by the Greeks in 560. Uh, it was begun. That would be destroyed at different points and then rebuilt. And then here's an artist's rendition of during the Roman era. Show the next slide. There you go. You see a very packed city. Um, and it was a port city. There were ships that would come to Ephesus. Um, there was a library at Ephesus that was a glorious. The facade of the library is still there today. If you go to Ephesus, you can see that um, and see the, the glorious picture of what used to be. In fact, they still hold concerts and events that are there. It's a, it's a beautiful place. But the ruins are rather extraordinary. The ruins are are beautiful, and you, you can learn a lot from that. In fact, this um, amphitheater that is there would hold over 50,000 people in that amphitheater. Now, the apostle Peter would be preaching um, in this city at different times. The apostle Paul would actually create a riot at that, at that very amphitheater. They were drugged down there in the midst of resistance to the gospel when so many people came to faith there. But in, in John's day, and here's another artist's rendering of what it would have likely looked like there from the amphitheater or from the theater looking out across the city, it was a glorious, influential Roman, uh, Roman city. Ephesus was quite the place to be. And it certainly would be the place that one of the most influential leaders of the church in his old age would hail from. And it would be that John would stay there until eventually, under persecution, he would be sent out to the island of Patmos. So let's go to the setting that is here, and this will help us as we understand better. The reason that we study these things is so that you can understand the actual text that we read. Very quickly, I want you to notice a few things. The date of the writing is approximately 91 to 93 A.D., that's why we would say that John is quite a bit older at this point. The place of the writing is either Ephesus or Patmos. Some have argued that he actually wrote it when he was in exile on the island of Patmos. That is possible, but likely perhaps Ephesus while he was there. The third one is the apostle John is quite old. He's in his mid-80s. Now some of you would say, well, wait a minute. I'm in my mid-80s and I don't feel quite old. Why would you call it that? Well, the life expectancy of the Roman Empire, I guarantee you, was that most were long gone by the time that they got to their mid-80s. So John would have been considered an exceedingly old man. Now, in God's wisdom and in his grace, he didn't have all the disciples the same age when they were with Jesus. John was perhaps the youngest, knowing God knows what is going to happen over the next decades, that these others are going to get older, these others are going to become bolder, these others are going to be persecuted, some of their lives are going to be snuffed out, and John is going to live longer for an important stage in the life of the church as the apostles, the eyewitnesses are going away and now the church is going on with the writings that they leave behind. So the apostle John is quite old and highly respected. And one of the reasons he would have been highly respected is because as we said earlier, he was an eyewitness and he was an eyewitness of the inner circle. So people could say as as doubts were coming up or as arguments were coming up, John could be looked to as an authority on the matters because they would say, wait a minute, there's a guy that's still alive. He was with Jesus. He heard it with his own ears and he saw it with his own eyes. God would use that as we see at this critical moment in the life of the church. Notice the next thing. The true gospel had flourished in Asia Minor, right above Asia Minor, Turkey. Um, that's Turkey, Asia Minor. The true gospel had flourished, but so had, fill it in, false teachers. You know, Satan always has a counter argument for God's word. We see that in Genesis chapter 3, when God says, don't eat of the tree of this in the garden, and Satan shows up. We talked about it in starting point. And what did we say Satan shows up and says? 
Did God really say, really? Did he really? Not only does he ask, did God really say, but then he even deposits things that God didn't say. He takes it and he twists it and he turns it and he lies. And so whenever the gospel, but whenever the word of God goes out in a fallen world, there is in this present era, there is a counter argument that seeks to rise up. And we see this, but, but Christ said upon this rock, the rock of who he is, the truth of who he is, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We see that false teachers will rise up, but they will not prevail. But nevertheless, we see that false teachers brought false doctrines. Fill that in. False teachers brought false doctrines. Now, this next statement is really important. Like so often, second and third generation Christians were struggling to believe the right things and live the right way. What do I mean by that? When someone, maybe alone or with their wife, and we've we've heard of a testimony of a husband and a wife coming to faith in Jesus, and there's when I look out across this room, I see that many of you have come to faith. Some of you are alone in your faith. Your your husband or your wife has not come to faith. But but when we see people come to faith in Christ. And their family was, were not Christians or, or something like that in different, different scenarios. Very often their, their faith may be strong. They've been saved out of the world. They've been saved out of the hardships. They've, been, they've discovered the truth by God's grace. And they were radically changed and they're strong. They come to grow and know. But very often the children of those who have grown up in a, children, in a Christian home very often there's a struggle. There's a struggle for them to continue in the faith. And sometimes even to the next generation, the grandchildren of the original believers sometimes take much for granted and fall away. This is, this is a common refrain throughout history. This is a common fr- refrain in the Old Testament that there would be a great man of God, but his sons would not walk in his path. It's a common refrain in the New Testament, and it's a common refrain throughout Christian history, and maybe it's even a common refrain right here in our church, that sometimes a man or a man and a woman or a woman will walk closely, steadfastly with the Lord, but yet their children will falter or greatly struggle. My friends, that is a reality for us to look at and to to recognize that here we see that this wave of Christianity had gone out in the first century. Many, many people had become followers of Jesus and were genuinely changed. And we, we saw that whole cities were thrown into an uproar because so many people were no longer buying the gods and, and offering the sacrifices and doing the other things because they had found Jesus. But then a couple of three decades, four decades later, perhaps their children are hearing the false teachers and the false doctrines, and some are beginning to falter. We see that happening in 1 John. We see that happening in the setting. Like so often, generation, second and third generation Christians are struggling to circle it, believe the right things, and to circle it live the right way. Well, what were, they, what were they struggling to believe? They had doctrinal problems. This is the first one, believing the right things. They were, they were actually believing the wrong things. There were false teachers influenced by secular philosophies from Greek and Roman culture were infiltrating many churches. So these teachers that were pretty gifted, silver-tongued folks would come into a church and they'd say, wow, here's an audience. And they say, yes, it's Jesus, but also, have you heard this? Jesus wasn't really that. Jesus was this. I mean, they would come in, they would have an audience, and that's that's what Satan does. He weaves those people into God's people every chance he gets a chance, every time he has a chance. Notice this. Wrong beliefs about the nature of God had crept in. And we see John deal with this. As we read it, we'll see that. Wrong beliefs about the 
person and work of Christ. Who was Jesus really, the person of Christ? What did he really do? How important was his life and death? We see that, that these false teachers were altering the truths of what had been taught about who Jesus really was. So what were, they, what were they maligning about Christ? They were denying Jesus was the Messiah or the Christ. Messiah and Christ mean basically the same thing. The anointed one, the Messiah, the one who would take away the sin of the world. So they're denying that Jesus was the Messiah. They're denying Jesus was really the Son of God. And they're denying that Jesus had really come in the flesh. They would say, oh, well, you know, there's, this, is, this is what we call incipient Gnosticism. The idea of knowledge is, is, is such a, a grand issue, and there's a great dichotomy between the body and the spirit. Anything that has to do with the flesh is evil. Anything that has to do with the spirit is righteous. And we see the, the apostle John is having to show that, no, Jesus really was God in the flesh. And he really did go all the way to the cross for our sins. There were teachers coming and saying, well, he was God when the Holy Spirit came upon him at baptism, and then just before he went to the cross, the Spirit of God left that person that you call Jesus, and Jesus, the Son of God, did not really die on the cross. It was really just that, because God would never submit himself to that. God would never take on the sins of the world for that. He would not do that. Well, all of those things are straight from the pit of hell denying the person and work of Christ. And in this day and time, we see others that will often come, whether it's the Jesus seminar or various Jesus movements, various doctrines coming along and denying who Jesus Christ really is. This is classical liberalism, and this is many other aspects of theological, philosophical beliefs that are often taught not only in universities and colleges, but also in seminaries that deny who Jesus truly is based upon the scripture. Notice this, the last one, denying Jesus' death was necessary for the forgiveness of sins. We're going to see that John deals with that. John says, oh no, he really did have to die, and he did die so that you can be free from your sins. So John is cleaning up doctrinal errors um, that are there, and he is rebuking them. Another thing that we see here is he's talking about obedience problems. This is not just believing the wrong things, but living the wrong way. You see, false teachers had brought division and quarreling, and then they left leaving many disturbed. And so John basically comes along and he calls them right out there to the side, the Antichrists, the Antichrists. Um, that's what the false teachers, that's how John is referring to them. And not just the false teachers, but also those who would follow him. These are the people who are teaching the wrong things about Jesus. They're anti-Christ, they're anti-Messiah. And so we, we're, we're going to see that. He's correcting that. Folks, we need this because our world is confused about who Jesus is. This, is this, this letter is part of the doctrine of Scripture that helps us understand who Jesus is and what he did for us in such an encouraging way. What we also see their obedience problems was there was a lot of hatred and a lack of love was in the hearts of some. We see that the Apostle John is calling that out and he's, he, you're going to see the conversations about, do you love your brother? Do you hate your brother? What is happening there? What about the next one? Some made sin their practice, their way of life. They were living in sin. And listen to this. This had to do with that philosophy that was coming into the church. The idea was, well, whatever you do in the flesh, yeah, that's sinful. But as long as your spirit is right, that's what God is interested in. That's, that's incipient Gnosticism with saying, well, you know, the flesh is going to sin, so you just go with that. That's okay. You can indulge in the things of the world. You can, you can just indulge your anger. You can indulge your lust. You can indulge those things. And, but really, the, the spirit is what matters. That he is saying to them, what? You're living like the world? No, you've been saved out of the world. You've been saved out of living in sin to live under righteousness for God. So he, 
He's seen this as an obedience problem. Look at the next one there. Many loved the things of the world instead of the things of God. And the Apostle John calls that out. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, do we not have that struggle today? Am I not tempted to love the, the stuff that this world has to offer instead of loving God and the things that are eternal? I mean, get out your checkbook. Go look at your bank statement. Go look at your credit card statement. Just see, you know, where, where do we spend our money? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What do you do with your money? I'm not saying it's wrong to have something that's nice, but friends, the, the picture is this. Do, do we live chasing after the things of the world? Do, if we're really honest before God, and that's, you know, this is between you and God, but is your heart more in love with the things that are eternal, or is your heart more in love with the things that are passing away? The Apostle John nails that one right between the eyes. We're going to see that. The approach of John, how does he do this? Fill this in. Notice how, how does he approach these doctrinal problems, these obedience problems, and the encouragement we need. He is both pastoral, so he's acting like a pastor. He, he, he's pastoral, and he's polemical. He's polemical. Some of you say, what in the world is polemical? Polemical is when your dad is upset about something and gathers the whole family together and says, okay, everybody, if you're not going to replace the toilet paper on the toilet roll, you're in trouble. Here's how my dad used to gather us all together and say, we are a family. We have to serve one another. If you're the last one using the toilet paper, you know, he would call the whole crew together and then he would talk about the fact that, I mean, on the simplest thing, and he, would, he was an engineer, so he would go into great detail. He would say, what you do is you go to the plastic cellophane wrapper. You tear it open. After you tear it open, you take out a roll. You have to start the roll a little bit. You get it going, and then you go to the little dowel rod in Side the holder. You pr depress one side of it, pull it out, and then insert the roller to that. And then you carefully put it back and let it spring into place. After that, you just let it come down. And so, you know, he would, he would say, do not do this is dishonoring to the rest of the family. So, now, you say, good night. He would get, he was being funny as he did that, but he was teaching us about that. When, when you're going at something hard, when you're attacking a wrong idea, when you're correcting something and you do it with strength, that is being polemical in talking about that. So it's a strong critical rejection or denunciation of false doctrine or something that is wrong. So John is both pastoral and gentle will see his warm loving language but he also is corrective very quickly john calls us back to bas the basics of christianity the basics of christianity he called john gently lovingly and pastorally encourages us in the true and secure gospel this is what he does. He encourages us in the true and secure gospel. John firmly and authoritatively, fill it in, refutes the false beliefs with crystal clarity. So you, you're, you're doubting the nature of God. You're doubting the person of Jesus. Let me tell you who he is and what he has done. He's counteracting their documents. John lays out with stark, circle those words, stark contrasts. He has very, very black and white, stark contrast between darkness and light, truth and lies, hate and love, children of God, and what? Children of the devil. John exposes the reality that the way we live reveals whether we are truly born again. That's what he's going to show us. Um, and he does so in some troubling ways that are very important for us. John patiently repeats the same basic truths in four ever-deepening or widening spirals. 
Many have said, if you were to try to outline, it's a difficult book to outline because he goes through it once, and then he goes through it again in a different way, and then he says it in a deeper way again, and then he does it again. So there's four spirals to it. Why would a teacher do that? Because a teacher knows that very often repetition and depth and a new perspective is what gets to the mind and the heart. So John is being very pastoral. He wants him to get it. He doesn't just say it once and says, well, I hope you got it. He wants when his letter is read to a congregation, when they gather together and they say, hey, we got a letter from John. We're gathering to read it Thursday night. Everybody gather. So they get the letter. They unscroll it. They, they get it out. And when they begin reading it, he wants them to get the message. So he says it to them four different times, four different ways so that it is clear. This is very pastoral. Well, I want us to do something this morning. Um, I want us to um, think about some questions, and then very quickly we're going to read. And these, these questions, we're not going to meditate on them now, but I believe that this will be very important for you um, this afternoon and this week, and I hope that you will do this. Questions for application, meditation, or discussion. Number one, how does the situation in 2021 AD, that's your life, reflect the setting of 93 AD. Go back and see what I've said about the things that are being doubted. Go back and see what I've said about the things that are being confused and maligned. Go back and see what I've said about our behavior and answer this question. What, what things fill it in? What things does society suggest to us to believe about Jesus? You see, our society has some images of Jesus. The question is, are they the biblical image of Jesus? I think that they're not. How does society, second question, how does society seek to influence our behavior in opposition to the way of Christ? I mean, how does our society say you ought to live in your sexuality? How does it say that you ought to live in your, in your material world? How, do, how does it say that you ought to live in your attitudes, in your actions, in your perspective on life, in your view of self, in your view of others? How does society say that? Uh, the Apostle John deals with that. And then number two, how does 1 John encourage you? And how does it rebuke you? And I hope and pray that you will spend enough time over these next weeks that we can do that. Now, we're going to read the letter of 1 John. Do you have your Bible open? We're going to read it. Notice this. Um, uh, go ahead and come, if you would, Todd family. I have asked the Todd family to help us. And um, if, you, if you don't have an ESV version of the Bible, um, I want to say to you, you're going to kind of wish you did just because it's so much easier to follow along when we're in the same version of the Bible. I want to encourage you um, to make sure that you're in the right place. Make sure that you're not at the Gospel of John, but you're at the little letter that says 1 John. If you don't know where that is, no problem. Just go to the book of Revelation and then turn back to the left a little bit and you'll find 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And um, something funny happened this week um, when, I, when I decided, you know, we need to read this. You know, when we studied the book of Philippians, we read the book of Philippians. When we studied Jude, we read the book of Jude. When we studied Titus, we read the book of Titus. And so we're going to study 1st John. We're going to read 1st John. Um, I called up Mike Todd and I said, hey, do you think that you could help me in reading? I, I don't want to read all of it myself. And he said, funny you ask. Would you tell us what happened with that? Why, why was that funny to you? It's, it's funny because uh, for some peculiar reasons, when we first visited Sheridan Hills Baptist Church, we were looking for a new church home, and I had made up my mind not to like it. So I had just decided wasn't gonna wasn't gonna like anything that I saw. I had my mindset against it. And one of the things that happened the very very first week that we were here is we had five guys get up and read the book of James. And that was one of those things that just kind of crumbled some of my bad attitude and opposition and and my obstacle that I had in my own heart because that was one of those things that just in no uncertain terms said this is a church that values the word of God. Hmm. In 1 Timothy, God's word says, give attention to the public reading of scripture. 
And so we want to do that. And we're going to read, we're going to read quickly, and, and I want you to see this. This will be the scripture washing over us. Let me pray before I begin. Father, we do now turn to reading the words of John. Lord, your words through John. Lord, we pray now that you would speak to us. We pray that you would help us to see things. Help us to understand this beautiful, ancient letter And Father, I pray that over these next months, that this letter would be used by your Holy Spirit to transform us more and more into the image of Christ. I pray that some would be saved from their sins because of this letter, and I pray that others would be moved on in greater maturity because of this letter. In Jesus' name, we ask for you to bless the reading of your word. John, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. I love this. So beautiful, so poetic, and that's the only statement I'm going to make. I could do that all the way through. I'm not going to do it. But notice 1 John 1 verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and held and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it. Remember, he was an eyewitness. And testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message, verse 5, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Chapter 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Verse 7. Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you which is true in him and in you because of the because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, 
is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy, the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now... Little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Chapter 3. Okay, hold on right there, Mark. Are you guys seeing the different doctrinal issues, the nature of God, God is light, the nature of Jesus, that he was the Christ? Are you seeing that he's talking about not practicing sin, not hating one another? These are all of those wrong doctrines, wrong behaviors that were infiltrating the church. Go ahead, Mark. Chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know, that he, uh, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, do not let, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Verse 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is the commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. 
And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Finally, in chapter 5, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in him. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave his eternal life, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. Verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything to, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that, that we have asked of him. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, this there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, 
but there is sin that does not lead to death. We're going to discover what he's talking about there as we study that. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Verse 19, we know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the devil, of the power of the evil one. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols.